All right, everyone, uh, welcome again to another uh, presentation for RPI's Computer Science Colloquium Series. So today we're going to have Professor Zhu coming from the University of Virginia. He's a professor of computer science there. Um, today he's going to be talking about algorithmic information design, computability, robustness, and learnability. Um, so if you have any questions as the presentation progresses, just put it in the chat. You should be able to see them. And, you know, I'll answer when appropriate and make sure when you do the chat too, uh, that you set it to chat to everyone, just so we can see the question instead of sending it privately. Um, to professor Zhu. Uh, <clears throat> all right, so take over. Um, thanks, George. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks for inviting me here. Um, so, and thanks everyone for coming to the talk. Um, so uh, so I'm very happy to share my work with, on information design. So this talk is going to be a combination of a slightly older paper a few years ago, and which I have been working on algorithmic aspects. So the computational aspects of information design with uh, some combination that. Uh, so I saw the okay, so good. I saw some chats. So yeah, some kind of recent work on machine learning side for the problem as well. So. Uh, let me get started. Uh, here's my agenda for today. I'm going to start with the uh, introduction about, uh, you know, what is a problem for uh, information design? And then I will talk about uh, two algorithmic aspects of uh, information design. The first one is a computational question for designing algorithms. Uh, and the second one is a, a machine learning question, how to understand the, you know, the learnability of the problem, which turns out to be naturally related to uh, robustness of the model as well. And finally, I will briefly conclude and highlight a few uh, interesting future work, uh, future directions. By the way, please feel free to uh, ask questions on uh, on chat, which I already figured out how to use it. And also feel free to raise your hand or just to speak loud during the, out of the middle. Good. Okay, so um, so let me start with a brief introduction. Um, so uh, you, so talk, when we talk about information design, I think a natural way to introduce this is uh, another kind of a close relative to information design, which has been studied very extensively. It's called a mechanism design. So what is mechanism design? It's basically the question of how to design the incentives of self-interested agents, typically by through designing, you know, the you know the game rules and you know, the payoff structure. Therefore, you can you know influence the agents' actions so that they can uh, together be steered towards some desirable social outcome or global outcome. And one such example is uh, you know the most uh, the very widely studied question is uh, auction design, right? So. There, what you are trying to design is a game rule, right? The entire payoff structure, who gets, uh, uh, so let's say you have one item to sell to a bunch of uh, potential buyers. What you got to design is entirely the game payoff. And uh, what you want to achieve is basically, you know, to maximize your revenue or maximize the social welfare uh, during the sale. So that's some kind of global outcome. And that's the question for mechanism design. And uh, information design, the question of information design uh, basically also wants to influence agents' actions, but through a completely different way, uh, which is not about the incentive, but is about controlling the information that the agents may access. So why, you know, why we care about information design? Well, because you know, when we're making decisions, not only the incentives that matter to our action, but also how much we know about our decisions would also matter. Yeah. In particular, the uncertainty in our decision making would affect the decisions. And uh, moreover, in this kind of digital era, uh, uncertainty is really rife uh, in reality. That happens you know, in many situations. Uh, but of course, the study about you know, how to understand how information may affect the agent's decisions, uh, you know, it has a, a long history. In fact, the, you know, the whole literature on Bayesian, uh, Bayesian games, and uh, which also won you know, multiple Nobel Prize about uh, understanding Bayesian games, uh, that has been very extensively studied. But, the pro but the, this kind of problem of strategically control or re release the information to agents, 
in order to actively influence their behavior and their actions, this problem turns out to hasn't is far less explored and has attracted much recent attention in uh, economics and in computer science as well. So that is going to be the focus for us today. <clears throat> And as I said, you know, there were really a lot of examples where, you know, people's decisions are affected by uh, the information they have. Here, I'm having a very simple example, which is uh, from Uber. And you can see that, you, you know, th this is basically what I cut from the Uber's guidance to, for the drivers to see, you know, which area have the search uh, demand and the search price and which area do not. If you look at the map, you can see, you know, this hot area have a higher search price and this uh, uh, not, not so hot area going to have a lower search price. And you can see that this is exactly an instance or example that Uber is trying to reveal those demand information at the different area in order to influence the driver's choice about where they're going to go, right? And that's just, you know, that's a concrete instance where information would affect people's behavior and therefore may lead to some, uh, may has a power to influence the outcome of the, uh, of the interaction. Um, so to make the problem more formal, let's kind of, you know, uh, consider a concrete question about how Uber can make a recommendation about where the driver should go. And this can be viewed as a simple game played between a driver and uh, any ride hauling platform, for example, Uber, right? Uh, so to be concrete, let's say, you know, the driver is deciding between going to some zone A or zone, two, zone B, which are two places on the map. So he only decides to go to either A or B. And uh, zone A is a place with, with the constant demand. So, you know, if you go to zone A, it's always the same demand. You can think of it as some kind of residence area, which, you know, have all, almost always have similar number of people requesting Uber. Uh, and the zone B has fluctuating demand. So with probability two thirds is demand is H or high, and with probably one third is demand is low. You can I think of, you know, B has ha as some kind of, uh, you know, town center area, depending on whether there's big activity there or not, maybe the demand is, uh, uh, some, you know, some kind of place where, you know, possible the activity may happen. So which can I give you a high demand or not? And each day, the zone B's state will be sampled freshly from this distribution, two thirds and one third. And now the driver is deciding between, you know, going to A or B. Uh, but so this would, his decision would be controlled by the utility he's gonna get at a different uh, region. So if he go to B, then he's gonna get utility two if the demand there is high, but utility zero if the demand there is low. But if he go to, uh, uh, place A, then he always going to get uh, slightly above one utility because the demand there is very, you know, stable. It's kind of uh, always the, this amount of demand there. And, you know, you can depict this kind of uh, payoff at B at, uh, by this kind of uh, picture here. So it's high or has utility two with probably two thirds and zero with probably one third. And, but the driver, you know, is uh, a priori, he only knows place B's prior uh, probability, he don't know what exactly going to be the demand there today. Therefore, when the driver is facing such a decision, he would think about, you know, which place should I go, right? Uh, without any additional information about the demand at B, how should the driver make the decision? Well, he's going to take a, you know, try to calculate some expected utility for going to B, which turns out to be, you know, this number, because it's two thirds, with probably two thirds is two, and probably one third is zero. And you can see that this number is four over three, which is gonna be larger than one plus epsilon. And think of epsilon as very small, and which is the utility and the constant utility he can gonna get at zone, uh, zone A. Therefore, without any, without any additional information, the, the driver would prefer to go to B, this uh, place with the fluctuating demand. Uh, is this clear to everyone? Good. Um, and on the other hand, the platform uh, is uh, having a different utility. Uh, so the platform would want to maximize the probability that the driver goes to A, which is, you know, this uh, constant demand place. You know, maybe because A has uh, more potential for the growth in the future, or maybe the company just wants, uh, you know, uh, uh, stable, uh, stable revenue. Uh, 
as opposed to, to fluctuating revenue. Um, and but what the uh, platform has is it has an informational advantage because as the platform he can observe the exact realized this demand state at location B. So the question we're going to look at is how can the platform maximize the probability of for the driver to go to location A, which is all that the platform that uh, cares, and how can the platform leverage his informational advantage? in order to influence the driver's behavior. Okay, so let's try out some kind of, uh, you know, uh, idea. The first attempt that you might think of is, uh, you know, what if I don't do anything? I reveal nothing about, no information about the demand and B, just let the driver pick. And in this case, we have discussed in the previous page, uh, the driver is going to act based on his prior belief, which is, you know, two thirds is two and one third is zero. And therefore, he can always pick uh, the location B. Therefore, the platform is going to get expected utility zero, which means you know the probability going to location A is going to be zero, right? Um, okay, so that's not a good idea. Uh, but what about the our second attempt? Uh, what if the platform simply just reveal full information about the demand at B? That is, you know, whenever B has low demand. So he gonna just tell the driver, you know, the demand at B is low. And in this case, the driver's best response action would be going to A because when it's low, the utility is zero, which is less than A's utility. That's one plus epsilon. Uh, and on the other hand, when it's high, the, the platform is gonna tell the uh, driver the demand is high at B. So in this case, the driver would go to B. And therefore, in this case, you can see the platform gonna get expected utility one third because, uh, you know, with one third, uh, one third of the time, the driver will indeed go to A. So, you know, this is slightly better um, uh, than the previous no information case. So one remark I, would, I want to make here is uh, instead of, you know, revealing this demand, the demand state uh, directly, the, the platform could have equivalently make a persuasive action recommendation. In other words, instead of directly telling the driver, you know, the demand is low there, the platform could have directly make a recommendation saying that you should go to location A, right? Um, and in this case, he can directly make a recommendation, then you just go to location B. And, uh, you know, such a recommendation is persuasive because when I was telling you, you know, if I follow this policy, in other words, I can do the following, you know, whenever it's L, I'm going to recommend a location A for you, otherwise recommend a location B for you. And this is a persuasive recommendation because whenever I told you to go to A, Indeed, A is going to be your best response, right? Because uh, you know, in this case, A uh, location B has low demand, and A is indeed your better choice. So therefore, uh, you know, this kind of uh, somehow equivalent view of this uh, uh, information revelation process is will be useful when we consider more complicated information revelation, as it will be clear in the next page. Uh, uh, is this uh, is this clear here? Okay, good. Um, so, and now, you know, at this point, um, we get utility one third, maybe you want to ask yourself, you know, can I do a kind of even smarter way so that I can get a utility even higher than one third? Uh, actually, interestingly, the answer turns out to be yes. And the idea is to reveal noisy information about the demand at B. And it turns out that in this case, the platform can get the driver to go to A with probability two thirds, which doubles the previous probability one third. And here is the idea. So in particular, whenever B has demand low, the platform is going to recommend the driver to go to A, uh, uh, which is natural. But when even when the demand is high, half of the time, the platform also recommend the driver to go to A, and half of the time, he's going to recommend to go to B. And now from the driver's perspective, he's going to receive a recommendation A with probability 2 thirds. But when he receives a recommendation of A, he know that A is not for sure to be good because with some probability, you know, uh, demand at B may be high. But at this point, the driver can have a base update about the posterior probability that location B has low demand. And it turns out that this posterior probability is exactly half because, you know, when I was recommended A, half of the problem mass comes from low and half the problem mass comes from uh, high. Therefore, conditional on this recommendation, place B would have a low demand with the probability half. And it turns out that half 
when low has probability half, the by the driver's utility at location B is the average between you know two and zero, which turns out to be one. That's exactly smaller than the one plus epsilon, then uh, which is the utility at uh, location A. Therefore, in this case, this recommendation of A is indeed persuasive because the driver would indeed uh, prefer to go to A at this point. And this kind of random, you know, action recommendation procedure is what we call a signaling scheme. So it, it tries to use the action recommendation to partially carry the information about the underlying demand. Uh, demand. And uh, that, you know, that's kind of a partial information revelation procedure. So is this example clear to everyone? Good. Uh, so, and um, so I want to, you know, a simple remark that I want to add, uh, uh, note here is that how, how can we implement such a kind of uh, signaling scheme in reality? Well, as I mentioned, one way you can do is you can just make the action recommendation, you know, follow just like the previously what we did in the scheme. Another way you can implement this uh, revelation, information revelation is by just directly showing the average utility at the different uh, place. Uh, for example, instead of recommending action one, uh, sorry, action A, you can just uh, directly show the average utility, which is uh, just average for one here, and it's one plus epsilon here. Uh, an important note I want to mention here is that you have to, whatever, you know, which choice you are picking here, you have to be consistent with the truth. In other words, you know, whenever you show the average utility is one, it has to be indeed it's one. And because otherwise, you know, if it's just a wrong number, a wrong expected utility, the platform gonna lose credibility, which makes his numbers not credible. And that gonna, you know, that will be very bad and the driver wouldn't follow their number, uh, recommendations. And this would bring us to the commitment assumption. That is, we're gonna assume that the platform gonna commit to this signaling scheme, and therefore, whatever you know he is revealing, that that must be credible. And this is also you know the key assumption that's assumed in the in all, almost all the recent information design literature, and is also going to be the assumption that we're going to assume in our uh, in this entire talk as well. Um, so we have a question here um, in the chat. What what would happen if the app just recommend A with the prior belief? steer the driver to be exactly so that's what i meant by the credibility assumption if the you know if the platform always recommends a so that is not a credible recommendation because uh, you know the true expected utility is actually uh you know the true best response is actually b and after a while because the driver is on your platform every day so after a few days the driver would be able to figure this out and then you would lose credibility yeah good uh, any other questions here Good. So um, this so abstract in the example before is basically what I mean by information design, which sometimes is also called persuasion. So at, so uh, at a high level, the problem of persuasion is basically try to exploit an informational advantage in order to influence the decisions of others, um, and the way is to by selectively revealing private information uh, from the by se uh, selectively reveal private information. For example, you know, in the previous uh, uh, example, the platform is trying to privately reveal the demand information in order to control the driver's uh, actions and choices. And it turns out that not only in the, you know, in these platforms, uh, persuasion is really an intrinsic uh, behavior in many human activities. For example, if you think about advertising or, you know, or maybe marketing, negotiation, even a lot of activities in politics uh, and, you know, security domains as well, you know, persuasion really happens almost in all these domains. Therefore, unsurprisingly, there has been a, a very large of recent work in e economics, which try to understand the power of computation in uh, uh, persuasion in many different applications. And the persuasion, you know, it's also very prevalent uh, in this today's digital platforms and uh, besides the, you know, the Uber example I mentioned before, there were many other examples where persuasion happens. For example, you could imagine Google Map may try to strategically reveal the traffic information in order to persuade selfish drivers to take different routes so that overall we can reduce the entire latency over the, you know, over the road networks. Uh, 
Another example is a recommender system like Yelp. They may try to persuade the users to, to explore you know, some kind of new uh, restaurants or explore the restaurant that is more beneficial for Yelp. Uh, this simply because Yelp typically has more information than the user about you know, various aspects of uh, the restaurants there. And another widely used example, uh, widely studied example is the online advertising auction, also called ad auction. Uh, you know, for here the auctioneer can try to reveal partial information about the ad opportunity in order to influence bidders' behaviors. A third example is the defender adversary interaction, where you could imagine a defender can privately can reveal private information. Uh, to influence the attackers, uh, uh, defense, sorry, to influence the attackers' attack choice, therefore over improve the defense overall. Um, you know there are many other studies about uh, persuasion as well in voting or marketing, in inventory disclosure or queuing. So if you have used the Amazon, very likely you must have seen some kind of message like this. You know there were only four left in the stock, and this kind of uh, in inventory information disclosure is exactly try to influence the buyer's uh, behavior uh, when they are looking at the items. This is another example of strategic information revelation. Uh, in fact, I think the importance of persuasion can be summarized by the following title of a paper uh, at the American Economic Review. It says one quarter of GDP is persuasion. So this really shows that you know, many economic activities do involve such kind of strategic information revelation. Uh, so in this talk, I won't have time to cover, you know, these various types of persuasion model, but what we're going to focus on is arguably the most foundational model in this space is called the Bayesian persuasion proposed by Kamenitsa and Jensko in 2011. So in this Bayesian persuasion model, there are going to be two players, a persuader, who we're going to call him the sender, and a decision maker, who is the receiver. In my previous example, the platform is basically the sender who's going to strategically send the information to the driver, who is the receiver, who's going to take an action. And the receiver is trying to choose an action from one to N. You know, uh, for example, the driver is deciding between you know, uh, place A, the a or B uh, zone. So action, each action I has a random type theta I which determines both the sender utility S theta I and the receiver utility R theta I. We're going to call the theta, which is the combination of all the action types together as a state of nature. And we're going to assume this is draw from some common prior. For example, you know, the demand of uh, the place B is draw from some common known prior. That's going to affect the both players utility. Uh, we assume that the sender has the informational advantage in the sense that he can exactly observe the realized the theta, but the receiver only knows the prior. For example, Uber can observe exactly the demand at the, D, at the location B, but the drivers cannot. The but driver only have a prior belief. The persuasion problem is basically the sender's optimization problem of design and importantly commit to such a signaling scheme X uh, a signaling scheme, as I mentioned before, is basically a randomized map from a state of nature to the signals. In my previous example, the platform is trying to map the state, which is the demand at D, to a signal, which is the action recommendation. And after the receiver receives the action recommendation, he's going to best update his belief about the, prior, uh, about the state and then make a decision accordingly. Um, the, after the, this signal scheme was committed, then the, when the state of theta is realized, the sender would communicate a signal sigma to the receiver before the receiver picks action. For example, when the demand was realized, then the Uber is going to communicate an action recommendation to their uh, driver, and the driver decides to follow that recommendation or go to another place. So that's the model we're going to look at. Um, Okay, um, as I mentioned, an important assumption here is the commitment assumption. That is, I'm going to assume you know uh, that the sender would commit to the signaling scheme. It turns out that this is well motivated due to multiple reasons. First, uh, first, this would naturally arrive at equilibrium if you think about the game going to be played repeatedly. Like Uber is going to interact with the driver repeatedly, and assume both players going to care about their long-term payoff. Right. In this case, commitment somehow is equivalent to credibility. Because if I'm not uh, committed to something, then the driver wouldn't believe in me. 
Therefore, I cannot try to induce any desirable action I want him to take. And you can show that at the equilibrium of this repeated interaction, actually it's gonna mathematically equivalent to make a commitment at the beginning. So that's a theoretical justification. And on the other hand, there were a lot of you know, practical uh, application, which is uh, commitment is easily justified. Particularly this kind of uh, signaling scheme typically are implemented as code, uh, or maybe they need to undergo some audits as the st statistical tests by these uh, IT companies. Therefore, that naturally informs the commitment assumption. And this is also what, this would also be the assumption we're going to stick with it, uh, stick with it during the entire talk. Okay. Uh, before I get into the technical part, one uh, small remark I want to mention is the so-called direct persuasive scheme. Uh, particularly in my previous Uber example, we can see that my scheme essentially is always recommending an action based on the state of nature. Such a scheme can be, uh, is called a direct because the signal is just an action recommendation. And an action recommendation should be persuasive because, uh, which means after the base updates, the receiver would favorite action would indeed be uh, the recommended action. And this is without, this turns out to be without a loss of generality because we can show that there always exists an optimal signaling scheme, which is direct and persuasive. Uh, in other words, you know, the drive, so the system can, or the sender can do all this kind of uh, base updates and the action choice on behalf of the receiver. Therefore, when he sent out the signal, the receiver only need to directly follow the signal. Uh, this, you know, um, is for those people who worked in mechanical design uh, before, this is exactly basically the revelation principle. Okay, so given this uh, background, then uh, the next part we're going to talk about is, uh, you know, how to design algorithm to do uh, optimal persuasion. So before that, I want to start by discussing, you know, why we care about the algorithmic lens, the algorithm, algorithmic studies for persuasion. It turns out that there are multiple reasons. First is uh, only algorithms can enable automated application, right? Imagine, you know, this, if Google Map want to implement such a signaling scheme, it has to be some algorithm that output the optimal solution. So there is a question uh, in the chat. So the question is, does persuasive have the same meaning as obedient in mechanical design? The answer is yes. Yeah. Persuasive is exactly the same meaning as obedient. Actually, in some places, it's just the code obedience. Uh, but I thought because we're talking about the persuasion, so I thought persuasive is uh, easier for people to follow. Yeah. Good. So besides, you know, enable the automated application, uh, per algorithmic study is also a good way to understand the complexity and the limitation of the model. Uh, because at the end of the day, efficient computation is an important model in pre-requests. Uh, here I want, uh, you know, I like to quote uh, a famous quote from uh, Camel, which says that, you know, if your laptop cannot find the equilibrium, then neither the market. Which means, you know, if you are, if you, even you cannot find the, you know, the, computer cannot find the optimal signaling scheme, how can we expect a regular human can find the optimal signaling scheme? Uh, and also efficient learnability is crucial for many real world applications as we're gonna see uh, later. And finally, as I'm gonna show in this talk that uh, this algorithmic study can nevertheless lead to very useful economic and structural insights about the problem. And that would also be you know, one kind of key point that I want to illustrate during the rest of my talk. And I'm going to show you how the computational study can lead to useful structural insights about the problem. Um, so let's come back to the Uber's recommendation problem. Uh, here, you know, let's consider a slightly more complicated example. Uh, so before illustrating our algorithmic study, let's try to look at a slightly more complicated example and see how the problem can get to uh, more complicated. Uh, now let's imagine that this place uh, the zone A and B are IID draw from the state of the zone A and B are IID draw from high demand, medium demand, and a low demand. Right? You know that's this is a different setting. I have two locations. Their demand are IID uh, draw from high, medium, and low. And the driver gonna get a utility two for high, one plus epsilon for medium, and zero for low. On the other hand. The platform would always want the driver to go to the medium uh, demand place, maybe because you know this place have potential for future growth. Uh, 
And that's what, uh, you know, the Uber cares about. Um, now let's look at, you know, how do you do optimal signaling in this uh, example? Um, you know, what if, so let's start with the simple case where what if the platform reveals no information to the driver? Well, in this case, because the driver have no information about A and B, they're going to appear identical to the driver because their demand is IID distributed. Therefore, the driver is going to randomly pick any zone, and this going to lead to expect the platform utility one third because any zone has probability one third to be a uh, medium. So that is uh, no information. Well, what about we reveal full information to the driver? That is, we're going to let the driver to learn what exactly is the demand at the two state? Well, in this case, the only the good case is for the platform. The good means you know the driver is going to go to M uh, demand uh, M demand location is basically MM ML or LM. In other words, uh, the, the it's good if uh, high demand didn't show up because in that case the driver is going to go to a high demand place, and uh, only M you know only uh, this M demand shows up. And in this case, you can see the expected platform utility is also one third because each of these situations happens with probably one over nine. And these are all the situations where the driver is going to go to a demand M place. So what is the optimal information structure in this case? Well, it turns out that the optimal uh, scheme would need to uh, reveal partial information. In particular, it needs us to uh, carefully correlate the information between high and uh, low uh, demand location. In particular, uh, the optimal, so it turns out that the following scheme is optimal. That is, whenever there's exactly one M type zone, and we're going to recommend it. Otherwise, we will recommend a zone uniform at random. Okay, in this case, we can guarantee this scheme is going to be persuasive uh, because the M, the, the driver utility for M is better than the uniform random average between H and L, which is one. Therefore, whenever an M type zone is recommended, it will always be accepted. And therefore, in this case, uh, you know, the, the lead, so the platform would be happy whenever an M type zone shows up. And this happens with probability five over nine. So that increases the platform's utility. This example here illustrates that, you know, the optimal scheme might require us to carefully correlate the different types at the uh, locate at the uh, receiver actions. Is this example clear? And we're going to call this situation IID uh, because, you know, the two actions for the driver were IID a priori, you know, the demanded information was IID distributed. Um, so this brings us to, you know, the interesting question of designing algorithms for computing the optimal signaling scheme. And it turns out that when the probability for all the states of nature theta can be explicitly enumerated, you know, you can enumerate this theta one by one, uh, it turns out the optimal signaling scheme can be computed by a simple linear program where the only variable here is x theta i, that is the probability of recommending an action i at some state of nature theta. Right? And given this probability variable, we can formulate the problem as a linear program where the objective is simply the expected standard utility. Uh, the first constraint is the crucial constraint. It's the so-called persuasiveness constraint. It guarantees that whenever an action I was recommended, the, the driver or you know, the receiver would uh, never prefer to take another action J. So I is indeed gonna be a best response. Uh, the remaining constraints are just a simple probability. It guarantees X is a probability. So this simple linear program is going to compute the optimal signal scheme. Uh, so that is for the explicit prior. But the problem is that this state of nature theta is high dimensional, right? It's a type. It has a type for each action. Therefore, in generally, it would be naturally high dimensional, and therefore, uh, its support may be extremely large. Though you might have, uh, you might be able to succinctly write down the prior distribution. One such example is the IID prior that we have seen before, right? So if you, if every action type theta I is I have IID distribution supported on some discrete set of size m, then the total number of states of nature theta is going to be exponentially large because the total combination of this vector is going to be 
uh, m to the n. And therefore, in this case, my linear program, the linear program I showed in the previous slides, one cannot be solved efficiently because it had become exponentially large. So interestingly, it turns out that even in this, uh, in this case, even though you have exponentially many states of nature, we show that uh, the optimal signaling scheme can nevertheless be implemented in polynomial time. That's a polynomial in the number of uh, receiver, sorry, receiver actions n and the support size n. Uh, this, this theorem is based on two structural insights about this uh, IID action persuasion problem. The first the structural insight is, the, is a very kind of, uh, is a very interesting analogy of the persuasion problem to the single item auction design with IID bidders. Okay, so imagine that you have a single item that you want to sell to a bunch of bidders, and it turns out that persuasion have a similar structure to that problem. In particular, you can think of the action recom actions as a bidder. Each action as a bidder, the action type is basically the bidder's type for their, you know, for, uh, bidder's value type for the item. And in this analogy, recommending an action would be similar to allocating the item to a bidder, to the corresponding bidder. And therefore, under this similarity, we can think of a signaling scheme as roughly equivalent to an allocation rule, except that we need to obey the persuasiveness constraint for the receiver, as opposed to the classical incentive compatibility constraint in mechanism design. So that is kind of the first interesting part of this uh, uh, persuasion problem. And then the second structural insight is uh, uh, you know, a, new, a result that we prove. In particular, we show that there always exists an optimal scheme that is symmetric in the following sense. First, each action will be recommended with the probability exactly one over n over r. And moreover, any unrecommended actions and also any recommended actions will essentially look the same a priori. In the sense, they're going to have exactly the same posterior type distribution, uh, you know, at, whenever it's recommended or not recommended. You know, this uh, this is a so we show that there always exists optimal signaling scheme that is symmetric in this sense. Given these two structural insights, we can formulate uh, the uh, the proof. Uh, the theorem can be proved through uh, the following formulation. That is, we can summarize this kind of symmetric schemes via the so-called reduced form, uh, which characterize the probability of recommendations for each uh, type of, of, the, uh, of the action. Uh, in the auction design literature, this basically is the probability of winning the item for each bidder. And then we can formulate the optimal signal scheme essentially as a linear program uh, over the polytope of the reduced forms. And that actually was uh, uh, studied the previous economic literature already by uh, economic uh, by economist Border, so he was able to characterize all the possible set of uh, reduced the, the possible set of all feasible reduced forms. People also call it Border's polytope, and our problem can then be formulated as a linear program over the Border's polytope, which uh, characterizes all the reduced forms, plus some uh, persuasiveness constraints, which turns out to be linear in the reduced form. And then we can solve this linear program uh, because recent, uh, due to recent uh, algorithmic study, which designs efficient separation oracle for the borders polytope. So that is how we proved this uh, theorem. Questions here? Okay, so we have a question in the chat saying, what do I mean by the posterior type distribution? So essentially, if you recall the Uber's example, when I recommend uh, location A for you, you can get an updated belief about the demand, which is high with the probability half and low with the probability half. That is what I call the posterior distribution over the type. Posterior distribution over high and low. Uh, any other questions? Good. Um, and so, so now we have an algorithm for the IID case. Uh, the next natural question you might ask is, you know, what if, what if for the what about the independent and non-identical case? Uh, in particular, uh, we know that in single item auction design, actually Borders theorem very nicely generalized to the non-identical bidder case as well. Therefore, a natural answer you would hope is uh, maybe our previous algorithmic result would generalize to you know non-identical receivers as well. 
Uh, but surprisingly, we show that uh, this actually seems to be true. In particular, in persuasion with the independent but non-identical actions, we show that it's actually sharply hard to compute the optimal expected standard utility. Um, so this implies that there's no uh, there's a, so there, there's no the, for the, uh, so there's something called the so-called the generalized borders theorem, which try to characterize, you know, the feasible uh, marginal problem, reduce the form for the economic problem. And this results show that there's a set, there's no such generalized border theorem for persuasion problem. Uh, so what goes wrong here? You know, why the problem, why the, an, our analogy to the single item auction previously doesn't hold for the non-identical action types? It turns out that the reason is fundamentally due to the difference between persuasiveness constraint and the IC constraint as a mechanism design. Uh, it turns out that persuasiveness constraint cannot be expressed using a standard reduced form for the mechanism design uh, problem. Uh, any adequate reduced form for persuasion has to encode a sharply hard problem by this theorem. Therefore, it cannot exist because otherwise uh, the polynomial hierarchy must collapse due to the sharply hardness result. <clears throat> and so that shows an interesting difference between you know persuasion problem and the mechanism design problem. Uh, you know, so what can we do now? We know that the problem is hard. So as a computer scientist, the natural question we typically ask is, can we look for an approximate solution? Can I design an approximate algorithm to, to solve the persuasion problem? Uh, the answer turns out to be yes. Uh, actually, we can design an approximate algorithm even for the much more general black box prior distribution. That is, I don't need to assume an explicit access to the prior distribution. or I need is just the samples from the prior distributions. Uh, but the algorithm in this case turns out to rely on some robustness property of the persuasion problem uh, that we're going to cover next, uh, which turns out to also related to the learnability of the problem as well. Okay, uh, so what is the, so the motivation for study robustness is really comes from a very simple uh, motivation. That is, uh, you know, we have some concern about the inaccuracy of the prior distribution. In particular, most persuasion is assuming that the sender have exact knowledge of the prior distribution. Actually, this is a kind of a common assumption made uh, that's made a lot in many economic studies. You know, we know exactly the prior distribution, but in reality, you know, humans can never have exact as can never exactly know the distribution of some random variables. All we can know is basically some you know estimation of the distribution, typically by you know from the samples that we can observe. For example, Uber would never know the exact distribution of the demands neither. All he can do is try to estimate the probabilities of the demands. Therefore, this raises a very natural question, you know, when we do persuasion. That is, you know, how can you do persuasion if you only know an approximate prior P tutor? That's not exactly the prior distribution P, but it's somehow close by. Right? So the question is, you know, is optimal persuasion scheme robust? to such small estimation error about the prior distribution, right? This is a very natural question, you know, you want to ask for, for this problem because, you know, we can never estimate the prior accurately. Um, the bad news actually is uh, to the previous, uh, to, so the answer to the previous question is actually uh, bad news. That is uh, the optimal signaling scheme actually in general is gonna be fragile to uh, the prior inaccuracy. Uh, so here's an example that shows that you know the optimal signaling scheme may become very bad if your prior changes a little bit. Um, let's continue with the, the Uber recommendation example, but here I need a slightly different payoff function for the driver. So the driver here have three actions, A, B, C, three different places. So place A have a constant return for the driver, it's always one, so always give driver utility one, but for place B, uh, the state the state one is really bad for location B, but state two is really good uh, for state B. And on the other hand, C is the opposite. So at the location C, state one is really rewarding, but state two is very bad. And on the other hand, the platform would always want the driver to go to zone A, you know, maybe because again, it's a stable uh, stable revenue place. Uh, what we can do here is we can try to understand the driver's decision as a function of the 
probability for theta one. We want to know, you know, depending on the probability of the state being this theta one, uh, what would the driver's optimal choice be? Okay, and you can see that if the prior the probability for theta one if it's half, which means you know theta one and theta two are uniform at random, then in this case location one would give driver utility one, but location B is going to be the average of these two number, which is one minus delta. So it's smaller than one. Similarly, location C is also smaller than one. And in this case, that means with the prior 0.5, this driver would prefer uh, action one, which is exactly what the platform also prefers. Uh, in fact, you can, some kind of simple algebraic calculation shows that there's a small region around this uniform prior 0.5 in which the driver would always prefer action one. And on the right hand side of this region, state theta one has a higher probability, and this is going to make action C the most profitable for the driver. And similarly, on this side, the action C, B is the most profitable for the driver. And now imagine that if our prior was indeed 0 0.5, 0 0.5, uniform at random, you know, at the center, at the center here, then you can see that in this case, the optimal driver, the optimal signaling scheme is to reveal no information because in this case, the driver would already prefer action one, which is what the platform prefers as well. Uh, but now consider that what if your prior slightly deviates from this uniform random, uh, it becomes 0.5 minus delta and 0.5 plus delta. And it turns out this is the point here, which is outside the region of A here. And now you can see the no information here. If I reveal no information, it's not optimal anymore because if I re reveal no information, the driver would go to uh, B here, which is a disaster for the platform. And this example shows that, you know, a slightly deviation to the prior would make the, your optimal signaling scheme extremely bad now. Therefore, the lesson we learned here is that we may have to be robust to some small perturbation of the or small inaccuracy of the prior, because if we were not robust, then any small deviation to the prior would completely ruin our signaling scheme. Is this message clear? And this brings me to the natural question, you know, for doing robust persuasion. That is, I want to be simultaneously persuasive for some kind of or the prize in some small uncertainty set B. Uh, in particular, instead of being persuasive only for this, uh, the particular, uh, a single prior, I want to be persuasive for any prior P in some uncertain set uh, B. This is what I mean by robust persuasive. So uh, therefore, you know, given any kind of uh, prior distribution P tilde, which is not the exact prior, but maybe is close by, to the true one, we can design the uncertainty set which includes all the prior that's close by to the P tilde. And hopefully this, you know, this entire, this set, this region nearby P tilde are gonna include the, the optimal prior, uh, be included the exact the true prior P tilde. So I want to, so that, that purse B, uh, in this case, gonna contain all the scheme that's persuasive for any P that's nearby the, uh, your observed the prior P tilde. Um, and this, so the first question we want to ask is, you know, how can I uh, design an algorithm to be robustly persuasive? Uh, it turns out that this question is actually reasonably simple. You can formulate it as a linear program as well, uh, where your objective is the expected utility with respect to the, your observed prior P tilde, but your constraint is you're gonna be more, you're gonna be robustly persuasive for any prior that is close by to your observed P tilde. Uh, why you want to do this? Because you know that your P tilde was not exact and uh, the true P may be close by. So that's why you want to be robust to any P that's close by uh, within you know, L1 distance uh, epsilon. And a simple observation here is that this LB can be solved efficiently, uh, even though uh, you know, they have this constraint, uh, this more complicated constraint. Uh, I'm not gonna show the algorithm here, uh, but the true, question here is uh, how much utility the sender may have to suffer due to this more stringent constraint on the persuasiveness. Due to now I have to be robust for any prior that's close by to the, uh, to the uh, observed P tilde. 
uh, formally, what we want to bound is this gap, epsilon. Uh, that is uh, uh, the following. So I want to look at, so the first term here is that I only need to be persuasive for the observed P tilde. That's the case, you know, if P tilde was exactly accurate, then I only need to be persuasive for P tilde. And the second term here is uh, P tilde is inaccurate. Therefore, I have to be persuasive for any P that's nearby the P tilde within the L1 ball, uh, L1 distance epsilon. And clearly this term is gonna be larger because the first problem here is a less restrictive, a less constrained optimization problem. So it's objective is gonna be larger. So what we're interested in here is how much larger, you know, how large is this gap as a function of this uh, L1 distance or uncertainty diameter uh, epsilon. Uh, the bad news here is that it turns out that uh, in general, this gap is going to be large. Uh, in fact, regardless of how small your L1 distance, it, the, your uncertainty set epsilon is, there are instances such that the gap would always be larger than a constant 0.5, even though all your utility is bounded within you know, uh, a small region, uh, is bounded between zero and one. So you're always going to have a big gap uh, between uh, if you have some uncertainty. Uh, the intuition actually turns out to come up uh, from the previous example I just showed you. In particular, you can see because, uh, you know, in this case, action A is the only good action, but if you have to be persuasive for anything around A, uh, then if you're, when your epsilon, the uncertainty set is much larger than this radius, then you would never be able to uh, persuasively, uh, always, you cannot always robustly recommend action A. And that just makes your signaling scheme really bad. Uh, so there, I have a, uh, so I'm going to skip the formal explanation here. Uh, but it turns out that um, the so it turns out that so here it turns out that what truly matter is basically you know the radius of this region A it turns out to matter. If this region A was too small, then I cannot be robust to a large uh, num uh, to a big uh, bigger uncertainty region. Uh, the good news here is that it turns out that this radius of this region turns out to be almost uh, all that matters. Uh, in particular, we show that for any Bayesian persuasion instance, you can upper bound the gap by four epsilon divided by D times P0 square, where P0 is the smallest probability of the state. And the dependence on P0 was uh, somehow natural because if there's a state that you know, has very small probability, but uh, is extremely rewarding, then that state would be important. And you would need to identify that state in order to get a high utility. And that is why I have a dependence on this smallest state probability as well. Uh, and this, this theorem shows that, you know, the loss due to the robustness is going to decrease linearly in the diameter of the uncertainty set, which is the epsilon here. Uh, and this upper bound starts to take effect when this epsilon is much smaller than the uh, action region D, uh, which is natural as to expect because uh, that's just what we see in the previous example. Okay. Uh, the implication of this result is that in this situation, uh, if, if we were in a situation without extremely rare, st rare states, that means P0 was uh, large for every, act for every state, and without the extremely rare actions, which means the radius D was also reasonably large, then being robust to prior small estimation error is not uh, too costly. Uh, and it will decrease linearly as a function of the uncertainty epsilon. Uh, and it turns out that this bound is almost tight as well because we show that the gap was always lower bounded by epsilon divided by D uh, and P0. Therefore, the dependence on epsilon and D is tight uh, but on P0 is off by a factor of one or P0, uh, which uh, I think pinning down, closing this gap is a very interesting uh, future question. Okay, so for the remaining part of the uh, talk, um, I will just show you two brief implications of this uh, robustness property. The first implication is the algorithmic result. So if we go, come back to this black box access to the prior problem, Imagine that, you know, in a persuasion instance, you don't know the exact prior, but you can only sample from the prior distribution. Uh, it turns out that the previous lower bound result actually implies the following result. That is, you know, it turns out if for any large number of 
k, there exists a persuasion instance such that if you only have k samples from the prior, then your algorithm can never guarantee a constant approximation to the optimal signal uh, sender utility with high probability. And the reason is exactly due to the robust, the lower bound for the robustness property is because if there is a very good action whose, uh, re whose act region was very small is of radius one over k, then you would need more than one over, more than k samples in order to pin down that region. And uh, therefore, if you only have k samples, you would never be able to uh, pin down that good region and therefore makes your persuasion problem bad. So that's the first corollary. Uh, and not only for the algorithm result, it turns out that this uh, robustness also implies a learnability result. In particular, you can consider the following repeated persuasion problem between a long-lived sender, for example, Uber, and a stream of myopic receivers. These are drivers. And we can, you can in a setting, you can assume that the sender doesn't know the prior distribution P neither in advance, but all he can observe is just the realized state of nature. So, you know, the game is played repeatedly. Every day, the sender only observes a realization of the state of nature, and he doesn't know the exact prior distribution P in advance as well. The question we want to look at is, you know, how can the sender gradually learn the optimal signaling scheme uh, through this repeated interaction without too much regret. So regret is there's a formal notion of regret in online learning, uh, which I, I won't have time to cover, but it's kind of a standard notion in online uh, learning. Uh, it turns out that in such a case, uh, the previous robust in the result implies a very natural algorithm, which we call uh, robust against ignorance. Uh, it's the following. So at every, at each round T, you try to compute an empirical state distribution P tilde T which is based on the samples you observed in the past T rounds. And then you simply just do a robust optimal persuasion with the uncertainty set, which is the L1 uh, ball with a radius epsilon T that is roughly of uh, order one over square root of T. Uh, you know, that's just the, you know, this is the basic the algorithm. Every round you do a robust persuasion based on some particular uncertainty uh, region. It turns out that this algorithm can achieve the best possible uh, regret you can guarantee. That is, with high probability, this algorithm is going to be persuasive across all the rounds and suffer a regret square root of t, roughly square root of t. And this is also the best regret you can, uh, you can guarantee. We show that there's a lower bound, um, uh, which is also square root of t. Uh, so that, uh, this concludes, this basically uh, uh, concludes the technical part of the talk. Um, as a conclusion, so we show that, you know, uh, what I, so I mentioned that persuasion is intrinsic in many human activities, uh, in the many applications as well. And our algorithmic studies are crucial for large scale applications uh, because you need to implement those in the system. And also it can lead to a useful economic or structural insights about the problem. And uh, robust, the robustness of these economic models typically going to tie or closely related to the learnability as well. And I showed you one example where how the robustness property can lead to a, learn, a natural learnability result. And for the future directions, I, in this work, we only consider the robustness to the agent to the uh, prior distribution. But in general, the in general, you can also consider the robustness to the Sanders estimation about the receiver's utility uncertainty and uh, also the corresponding learnability problem. And you can also consider the robustness of general economic systems and the learnability of the corresponding economic parameters. For example, how can you learn to play against a follower in the Stackburger game in general, how to learn to classify uh, strategic agents, or maybe how to learn optimal auctions as well. And more generally, the example I've been talking about is always about persuading a single receiver, uh, but there's a, a very interesting question about how do you do uh, information design for multiple receiver settings, uh, particularly when they have a game among them. And that's it for all I want to talk. All right. Thank you for an excellent talk. Um, if anyone has any questions, just put it in the chat. Uh, make sure you're sending it to either all the panelists or everyone. And if you want me to unmute you, just let me know too, and I can do that. <laughs>
Yeah, it doesn't. It looks like uh, nobody has any additional questions. Uh, give it maybe a few more seconds before we close out. Yeah, uh, yeah. I'm sorry. I I probably run running over for like four or five minutes a little bit. Uh, yeah, it's no problem. It usually happens. <laughs> All right. Uh, okay. Yeah. Thank like to thank the speaker one more time. Great talk. Uh, thank you for taking the time to come and talk with us. Uh, yeah, uh, one thing I'd like to note at the end here is that, uh, so all these talks are posted. There is a YouTube channel for CS Colloquium. Um, so if you just search RPI CS Colloquium YouTube, you will find it. So this will be posted up there as well. If you want to come back to it or, you know, if you know someone that missed the talk and wants to see it. So be aware of that. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Thank you, speaker. <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye.